In the first part of this lesson, I will outline the development stages of a group and comment upon roles and actions in a team. In the second part, I will present principles and ideas for creating positive group dynamics in learning groups. So, why does group dynamics matter? All group members have their own personal histories and life experiences, knowledge and skills, vision and aims, as well as interests and needs. Group members are usually also members of various subgroups, for example, neighbors, departments, or they are representatives of an ethnic community. Participants come with their own values, beliefs, and principles. Now, when considering that each group member influences all other group members, as well as the group as a whole, it becomes obvious that each group of learners is unique and that each group develops its own dynamics. The term group dynamics is used to describe the processes that occur when people interact in a group. Being able to observe and understand these processes will help to make the teamwork more effective. Before we look deeper into the processes within a group, I want to note that also outside factors impact the dynamics of a group. This is especially true if most of the group members represent the same organization or subgroup. The following problems occur quite often. Participants are stuck in their daily hierarchies and tend to compete with each other. Key persons, for example the management or informal leaders, do not participate in the training. As a result, the event's prestige can suffer and the participant's motivation might deteriorate. On the other hand, the participation of key persons can also have a negative impact, as it might result in less openness and more cautiousness on the part of group members. If training activities are funded by an outside body, it might be required to consider their interests as well. This can result in less flexibility in designing and implementing the course. It also happens rather often that the process for selecting participants is not clear. This can create tension and bad feelings in the group. On this slide, I have also included some ideas for limiting the negative impact of such factors. Groups go through different stages of development. There is no guarantee that a group will reach the next development stage, and the length of time a group remains in a particular stage varies from group to group. However, there are things that a trainer can do to help the group reach the next level. Based on the work of Bruce Tuckman, Peter Wellhofer and Ebert Stahl, as well as my own experience in conducting team trainings, the following list summarizes the group development stages and actions that the educator or leader can undertake to support the group. In the forming stage, group members are occupied with their own emotions and doubts. Uncertainty about whether they will find their place in the group, what will the other participants be like, what to expect from the trainer and the training, etc. I thinking is the predominant attitude. Here the trainer must look assured and exude certainty in order to help group members find their places. The trainer must create a positive atmosphere and provide space for com communication and interaction. In this stage, the trainer must look assured and exude certainty in order to help group members find their places. It is important to create a positive atmosphere and provide space for communication and interaction among participants. In the storming stage, participants try to find their place in the group. There are many discussions, coalitions are being made to represent one's interests, and there is lots of competition. Many people talking at the same time and nobody listening is a clear indicator that the group is in a storming stage. What participants experience here will to a large extent determine how open or close they will be later in the process and how well they deal with conflicts and emotions. The trainer can guide the group through this stage by giving participants practical tasks that help to establish relationships and clarify roles. It is important to demonstrate confidence and leadership as this stage can get rather emotional. When participants have established principles and procedures for getting things done and creating a positive atmosphere, they have entered the norming stage. 
Here participants have finally found their place and feel safe in the group. I thinking is replaced by we thinking. The trainer can entrust the group now with more challenging and demanding tasks. It is important to find a balance between the group's wish to communicate with each other and the content of the training program. The highest point a group can accomplish is the performing stage. The result is similar to two people being in love. Participants feel proud to belong to this group, they have a strong belief that nothing is too difficult for them, interaction is based on complete trust and openness, and the group is highly productive. It should be noted that most groups never get to this stage, because it requires strong motivation, common goals, great emotional input, and strong commitment from the participants. In the performing stage, the trainer should step aside and limit his or her role to facilitating the process, thus further strengthening the group's ability to work autonomously. He or she might want to present the group with new perspectives in order to provide the group with further opportunities for development. A group is established in order to accomplish certain tasks. When this has been done, the group reaches a natural end to its existence or sets itself new tasks. In this case, the group development process starts again from the start. If the group will stop existing after intensive cooperation, participants need time to tie up loose ends and become familiar with the idea that the end is near. The stronger relationships have developed, the more emotional the parting process will be. The trainer should provide methods and tools for evaluating what has been done and for readjusting or setting new aims. If the team will not continue working together, he or she should help prepare the group for the end by providing opportunities to reflect on what has been achieved and by offering a perspective for continuing the established relationships. A few things to keep in mind. The time a group spends in a stage can be minutes or years, and there is no guarantee that it will get to the next level. The more the group members are used to teamwork and the better the support from the leader, the faster the group can get to the performance stage. And remember, the group development process is not linear. A group that has reached the third or fourth stage can easily fall back into the storming phase. Let's move on to some practical things a trainer can do to create a positive dynamics in the learning group. To a large extent, the starting phase with a new group will determine the atmosphere in the classroom during the whole course. In this phase, the trainer should achieve the following. Get participants out of their boxes and promote communication among them. Balance participants' expectations and the actual content or requirements set by the trainer and the program. And extract some background information about the participants that will be helpful later in the course. When a new group starts work, group members experience doubts and questions. As soon as the trainer enters the room, all focus is placed on him or her. The participants expect the trainer to provide them with the required information and skills and to ensure a positive atmosphere, an interesting teaching process and the possibility to learn more about the other participants. In order to create healthy group dynamics, it is important to overcome the participants' focus on the trainer and to develop relations among the learners. This is the main purpose of using icebreakers at the beginning of a course, small exercises that reduce tension and get people talking to each other. A mismatch between the content of the course and the learner's interests and needs is usually the main reason for dissatisfaction among participants. Previously circulated information is no guarantee that participants will have an adequate understanding about the course. Therefore, the trainer should clarify in the beginning what are the participants' expectations and interests. In most cases, it will not be realistic to introduce any major changes to the content because it is predetermined by the curriculum and other factors, or because certain expectations are expressed only by a few participants and do not represent the interests of the whole group. In these instances, the trainer will still be able to comment on the expectations expressed by participants, explain what will or will not be addressed within the course, and show the bigger picture by explaining the course's aims and content. 
As a result, everybody will have a more realistic understanding of what to expect and there will be less room for disappointment later. At the beginning of the course, participants will still be in their boxes and will most likely not publicly express their honest expectations. Typical replies are vague and general, for example, to gain new knowledge, to learn something interesting, to get to know new people. One way of gaining more in-depth information is to give this task to pairs or small groups. Participants are more likely to be frank with each other, for example, admitting that the true reason for attending the course is to get away from the family for a few hours, or admitting a weakness he or she wants to address. The group's potential is developed by gradually transferring more responsibility to the group. It is important to keep in mind that participants have to find a role in the group and learn to work together before they will be able to successfully take on major tasks. Group work is the main method for promoting this development because it takes the focus away from the trainer and develops a team in which participants can contribute with their knowledge and experience. Getting participants to effectively engage in group work is often not so easy. Everybody has experienced unsuccessful group work. Especially in the beginning of the teaching process, trainers often face a situation in which participants react negatively towards group tasks and the envisaged results are not achieved. The prospect of working in groups can raise doubts and anxieties in the participants that are similar to those experienced at the beginning of the course. The difference is that in the meantime the participants have already found their place in the group, have gotten to know their colleagues, know what to expect from the trainer and have adapted to the new situation. The result is a consumer mentality where they are prepared to follow the course but do not want to leave their newly gained comfort zone. On this background the trainer's request to work in groups is perceived as a threat to the established order. Again doubts and questions arise. Who else will be in my group? How should I present myself in the group? Why do we have to do this? Wouldn't our time be better spent continuing to listen to the trainer? These are typical questions that go through participants' minds. The trainer also often feels anxious about inviting participants to work in groups. Will they be motivated to work actively? What to do if they deviate from the topic? Will they keep to the given time frame? What to do with participants who don't participate? Maybe it would be better if I stay in control and continue guiding the participants through the content. The more the trainer himself or herself doubts the given task, the greater the chances that it will indeed be unsuccessful. Previous negative experiences with group work can decrease a person's belief in the benefits of this method. Therefore, the trainer should be prepared for a situation in which the learners will not receive the invitation to work in groups with enthusiasm. For group work to succeed, it must be carefully prepared. Group work requires trust in the participants and flexibility towards the process and results. In order to ensure that the participants' doubts do not transform into open resistance against the task, be definite when presenting the task. Do not give room for alternatives. If the task is phrased as an offer to the participants, for example, wouldn't it be a good idea if you continue now with working groups? It will create hope in the participants that there might be a way to avoid it and they might start revolting. Later in the process, when the group has become used to collaborative work, there is less resistance and more motivation for working in groups. In a nutshell, the less experienced the group, the more decisive the trainer's instructions should be. There are a number of ways of dividing participants into groups, randomly, based on common interests, based on sympathies, or based on a trainer's plan. Using a random selection approach, for example counting or picking playing cards, ensures that participants will get to know each other and that nobody is left aside. Selecting group members based on common interests, for example, similar background or similar aims, will make the process more purposeful and increase motivation. If participants create groups on their own, the result will be a positive atmosphere, but this method can result in less popular participants being left out. The effectiveness of group work is increased if participants first spend some time individually with the task. 
reflecting on what they know about the given issue, what is their attitude towards it, what could be their contribution, or what ideas they have for solving the given problem. For the group work to follow a structured and purposeful process, the trainer should offer a framework by using a method that provides a guideline for the work. To promote thinking outside the box and foster the involvement of persons who usually remain silent and let others do the talking, the inclusion of nonverbal elements is beneficial. For example, asking for the results to be presented as a drawing, collage or a performance. Last but not least, the trainer needs to be prepared to support the group work by clarifying the task, bringing groups that have deviated back on track or providing the groups the required resources. In this final part, I want to speak about roles and actions in a group. There are numerous tests to determine a person's potential role in a team, such as the Belbin test that highlights nine possible roles a person might have in teamwork. While such categorizations offer interesting food for thought and reflection, I personally have found them of somewhat limited practical use. In my opinion, it is more productive to focus on people's actions rather than on roles. A person can take on different actions that are required for the group to succeed. For example, timekeeping, writing down ideas, asking questions or reminding others about agreed rules, thus taking on co-responsibility for the outcome. Being aware of these actions helps the trainer to analyze processes in the group and to determine what corrective actions need to be taken. It is even better if the group becomes able to analyze its own actions and react to any shortcomings. On this slide I present an overview of actions to look out for in group work. It is based upon the work of Klaus Antons, a German researcher of group dynamics. You can use this list as a starting point in your learning group. Here is one idea how to do it. Divide the group into small teams and ask them to come up with concrete actions for each list item. For example, a team might add to showing initiative and activity the following actions. Making suggestions, expressing ideas, tackling an existing problem from a new perspective. For dominating, they might add arguing with others about the best ideas, talking non-stop, trying to be the most important person, or taking over leadership. The collation of all team results will offer a strong guideline to the participants on what to do and what not to do in their group. The collation of all team results will offer a strong guideline to the participants on what to do and what to avoid in the group. You can find more ideas on how to promote effective communication and collaboration in a group in the lesson Aspects of Effective Teamwork.